I'm Felicity Roddick and I'm Director of the WET Centre, that's the Water Effective Technologies and Tools Research Centre here at RMIT University. And uh, the AWA and the WET Centre, we're very pleased to uh, host this public lecture by Professor Carl Linden. And Carl's from the University of Colorado uh, Boulder and he's participating in a fellowship and this program is initiated by the Australian Water Recycling uh, Centre of Excellence. And the fellowships are designed to foster um, industry and academic partnerships. And Carl's working with us here at RMIT University to support Melbourne Water and enhance the implementation of their water recycling projects, particularly uh, those involving advanced uh, treatment. Carl is... Uh, the Croft Professor of Environmental Engineering at the University of Colorado, Boulder, and his work is focused on UV inactivation of, of persistent microbial pathogens and also um, UV and oxidation-mediated processes for the degradation of organic matter in water. And he has authored uh, more than 110 peer-reviewed uh, publications and he has been uh, invited to speak all over the world on water and water reuse. And so we're very pleased to have him here at RMIT and to be able to have, uh, provide the opportunity of him uh, telling us about some of his work with oxidation and to talk about something which is really important in the drinking water and the wastewater uh, reclamation industry and that's about disinfection and so he's going to talk about rethinking disinfection in drinking water systems. Thank you Felicity. Um, thanks everybody for coming out this evening. Appreciate your support and it's great to be here back in Melbourne. I've been here I think it's my fifth or sixth visit. It's quite a, quite a lot for an American to travel that much, but it's been a great time coming to Melbourne. I think I was first here in 2002 at the IWA Water Conference. I think it was 2002 or 2000 maybe. Um, and I met Felicity back then and seen her at a number of conferences. And since then, I've been back in 2006 as an RMIT fellow under a program here at RMIT that Felicity brought me back. And then I've been part of a few other lectures and conferences and now as part of this Australian Water Recycling Center of Excellence grant, which is really wonderful for me because I get to spend about 10 weeks in Australia over the year that I'm on the fellowship working closely with Melbourne Water and with RMIT University. So I want to thank Felicity for supporting that and I want to thank Judy Blackbeard also at Melbourne Water and I want to thank Mark O'Donoghue at the Australian Water Recycling Centre of Excellence for providing the funding for me to come out to Australia and um, meet all of you and spend some time here working, learning a lot about international perspectives on water as well as being able to share my expertise which is really uh, exciting for me as well. Um, just a quick poll before I get started. How many people here are water professionals or water research folks? Okay, and how many are not? Hopefully that's the balance of you. <laughs> and who just walked in off the street and has no idea why they're here? <laughs> yes. Hopefully I have something for everybody in my talk. Um, it's somewhat technical but somewhat also accessible. Um, and I'm going to talk about an, an issue that's really close to my heart in terms of my research themes that I've been working on for a number of years. I started working on UV disinfection using ultraviolet light for treating water when I was a graduate student um, in the late 90s. And <clears throat> I, I always come back to you know, the idea of why are we doing what we're doing in water and how are things changing and how fast are they changing or how slow are they changing. Um, so I put together some ideas uh, for you today about uh, thinking through uh, UV, thinking through disinfection processes, thinking through water treatment processes, and kind of questioning where we're at, why we're here, and if this is the right direction we want to go in in the next, say, 100 years, because we have to think big. So I titled my talk, And What If? And what if is like, what if we had c just started today and started realizing we have to treat water? Would we do what we're doing the same way that we're doing it? Or would we think differently about it, given that we know what we know about what exists and what the possibilities are um, in terms of you know, public health and, and drinking water treatment? So as an overview to my talk, and um, I'm going to have, have a little arrow here and I'll point out a few things. I'm going to try to stick here just because the microphone's here. Usually I like to roam around and use my remote, but I'll probably stick up here uh, most of the time. Um, but feel free to look at either screen. They both have the same thing on them, so you can go back and forth. Hopefully it's not too disorienting. Um, 
first I want to talk about public health, the whole idea of what do we do in drinking water treatment and why do we do, uh, why do we treat water the way we do. I'll give you a quick history of water disinfection in one slide. Um, then I'll talk about UV and UV as the new kid on the block, meaning like the new, the new technology is coming out or is it so new? And look back a little bit at the history of UV disinfection. Uh, then I want to take a kind of take on a trip of thinking about chlorine and think about chlorine if we just found chlorine today and would we use it and, and what are the issues around using chlorine. Now we'll do a little bit of comparison of some of the disinfectants that are out there and then talk about um, potential for a water treatment revolution and that gets really exciting. Um, think about revolution. So why are we treating water? Uh, well first thing is we have to protect public health and we have a number of challenges in treating water given our, our modern water quality concerns. The first challenge and the most important challenge is the acute issue of treating pathogens. If you don't treat water for pathogens, you can get sick right away. And perhaps you know, you'll be you know, having diarrhea, vomiting, you know, something that happens immediately in the, in the first few hours of, of sickness. So we want to protect the, water, protect the public from waterborne diseases. The other thing we want to do is make sure we remove any chemical pollutants. In our industrial society, today we have a lot of issues with um, release of chemicals into the water system, into the water cycle. I want to make sure we can remove those as part of a water treatment scheme. Those include both organic chemicals and inorganics. So anything from, say, arsenic that might be inherent in, say, a groundwater source to uh, maybe an organic pollutant such as uh, a pesticide or an emerging contaminant like a pharmaceutical residual. I want to make sure we can remove those chemicals that are a potential uh, human health concern. We also want to make sure we don't harm any uh, or form any new harmful chemicals during our water treatment process. And this is important because sometimes we do something that we think is a good idea, and then we learn later on that is actually some other consequences that were unintended, and we want to make sure we try to minimize those instances from happening. And then probably most important to the consumer is making sure the water tastes good. No one's going to drink the water if it doesn't taste good. So that's our third thing. We want to make sure we avoid any adverse taste and odor issues um, to make sure people want to drink the water and feel confident drinking the water. Because despite the fact that the water might be perfectly safe, if it looks muddy or if it looks dirty, no one's going to drink it or if it smells bad. And the result is hopefully appropriate water treatment solutions when we think about all these issues and putting them all together and, and protecting our water supply. So I, I did a little think about what an ideal water treatment process might actually look like. You know, if we could think about our ideal water treatment process. Well, the first thing, it would have no synthetic or harmful chemicals that would be used. And we want to have something that's clean. That's kind of for our modern age. You know, we think about being green, being sustainable. Uh, we don't want to have any unwanted byproducts that are formed. We don't want to have any residuals. Uh, by residuals, I mean things that form maybe during the water treatment process that we have to then have to remove and take away somewhere else and dispose of. Ideally, no unintended consequences, so things that you know, we didn't realize were going to happen. We'd like to use sustainable materials. We'd like to have a low energy footprint or even perhaps a no energy footprint if possible. We'd like to be fast acting. We want to have our water treated pretty quickly and we want it to be easy to operate. These are the types of things that I think would make an ideal water treatment process and hopefully we're all striving toward and we can never probably reach all these things but hopefully we'll, we'll reach a number of them in our ideal water treatment process. So let's look at a quick history of uh, water treatment. Uh, this graph here is kind of a classic plot that people show of why we just, when we started to treat water the, the impact it had on public health. What this chart shows is it's data taken from actually Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the U.S. And on the y-axis here is the number of typhoid cases, and on the x-axis is the year. So we have 1885 up to 1945. And these are the number of typhoid cases um, in the population. And it kind of gives you an overall um, trend of disease incidents. And there was kind of, a, you know, when, once people started coming together in cities and in urban areas, uh, there was pressure on water sources, and our waste tended to commingle with our, with our drinking water. And when that happens, anyone who has a disease, you know, those diseases, diseases can get transferred into our water supply, and that, that could perhaps make people sip, sick. And one of the sicknesses that was going around in this time was uh, typhoid fever. And so this is a data from typhoid fever, and it's the number of people who got sick in Philadelphia here in the late 18... 1800s. And you can see it's around you know, maybe 2,000 or so folks, and it went up a little bit. And then in 1906, they had to figure out they had to do something. A lot of people were dying of typhoid fever. They finally figured out, well, maybe it's the water supply. And remember, at this time, we just had figured out the whole idea of germ theory, that microbes actually cause disease in the late 1800s. So this is, and you can imagine uh, in, the, in that time, there's people coming with all kinds of cures for any ailment. You know, there's like all kinds of snake oil sales, when we call them, in the U.S. And so People are trying to figure out what's going on here. Can we do something that would be helpful to um, this disease that's going around? Um, so 
filtration was put in place to try to remove the general uh, types of, of particles that might be in water. And then in 1913, chlorination was implemented. And someone came up with the great idea of putting chlorine in the water, and actually it worked. It killed off the microorganisms. Chlorine was a toxic product, and it, and it worked to destroy the pathogens in water and make the water more clean. If you do it at the right levels, you won't harm people. You won't harm them from drinking the chlorine as well. So you can see that the impact that chlorine and filtration had on drinking water, because by the 1920s, we had pretty much almost eliminated the diseases that are caused by bacterial uh, pathogens. Um, so that was back in the early 1900s. Filtration was used with uh, doing sand filtration, and, and chlorine was a chemical that was added to the water. And pretty much we have the same process in place today that we're using. Um, in the 20th century, we started using processes such as uh, filtration and chlorination, and this is a, what is called a process diagram for water treatment processes. And this is the end of most treatment plants now, but what we had originally is sand filtration followed by chlorination and holding the water to let the chlorine contact with the pathogens, killing off the pathogens, and then being able to deliver the water safely to the community. And the main focus of this type of treatment is for killing off pathogens. Later in the 20th century, we started adding things on. We realized in the 1970s that chlorine actually, when it combines with certain things in water, forms byproducts. We call them disinfection byproducts. And so we want to make sure we can kind of treat the water ahead of time so that when the time the chlorine comes along and, and gets in the water, that we can minimize the negative consequences of using chlorine. So other processes were put in place um, up front, and that they included coagulation, which means like kind of taking out the particles from the water, and then they included a sedimentation step as well, and then that went into the filtration and the chlorination. And this is pretty much how we treat water today in the U.S. and in Australia as well and all around the world in a lot of places, not everywhere, but in a lot of places we do it this way. And what we're doing here is treating the water for pathogens, as we were before. We're also trying to take out particles, which are, could be um, suspended particles, could be colloidal particles that are, that are in, in the water. They're very small. We try to bring them together, coagulate them, and drop them out. We're also trying to remove uh, background organic matter, because the organic matter, when, it hits, when the chlorine hits the water and the organic matter is present, it can form byproducts that are potentially uh, harmful, that are some of them are known carcinogens. So we want to make sure we try to remove those as well. So that's what we're doing pretty much in water treatment uh, up through you know, the late, late 20th century and also into today. So I want to go over a quick history of UV light, because chlorine, as you saw, was implemented in the you know, early 1900s. But UV has actually been around for quite a long time, too. And there was a time when UV was in use um, around the same time that chlorine was being used. Back in the 1870s, it was first discovered that UV light from the sun had actual bactericidal cap capabilities. Um, in the early 1900s, the mercury vapor arc lamp was, was discovered and uh, invented, and then they had quartz sleeves that were put on uh, to enclose that lamp and allow the light to come out of the quartz and be used for uh, biological um, inactivation. Since then, UV light was used quite often in a number of places. The first time it was recorded for disinfection was in France, and then it was used in uh, for disinfection of, of sh in ships, for, for water on ships. And then it was implemented in a number of places in the United States um, during the early 1910s, 1920s in drinking water treatment plants. So you've actually been used for quite a long time, but at some point it kind of fell out of favor because chlorine was in use. Chlorine was plentiful, it was inexpensive, and it was effective for reducing diseases. Um, so what happened to UV light? Well, there were problems, you can imagine, with electrical supply reliability back in the early days of electricity and, and the use of, um, of these lamps, these lamp systems. Lamps didn't always last as long as they could, as they should have. Um, so that, that really minimized some of the applications. Um, There's also a belief that chlorine was more effective. UV wasn't as well understood. And eventually it grew out of favor um, in the 1920s and 1930s. And a number of facilities were abandoned uh, due to cost and due to reliability of electricity. Um, so chlorine was definitely the, the, the uh, disinfection process of choice. So now in the year 2000 uh, and beyond, um, UV's kind of had, had a little bit of a renaissance. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, for one, we're starting to disinfect our wastewater. Uh, we used to not disinfect wastewater. I know some, some, uh, some areas that, that have ocean discharges, they just discharge the wastewater right into the ocean without disinfection. But a lot of places require disinfection for wastewater treatment. And it makes sense to use UV for disinfection because, for one, it's very quick to inactivate. And for two, you're not adding a chemical that you, don't have to that you then have to remove before you discharge the water. 
So UV doesn't have any chemicals that add it to the water, but you can add chlorine to wastewater. If you want to discharge it to a sensitive water body, then you have to remove that chlorine because you don't want to have the residual chlorine in the water. That would harm the, the biota in that receiving stream. So UV makes sense a lot for wastewater. In the U.S., it really took off in the mid-'80s, 1980s, and now about half of all new wastewater installations are using UV. And here in Melbourne, also, there's two big wastewater treatment plants that use UV disinfection. One's the eastern treatment plant, and one's the western one. They both have different types of UV disinfection. They're both used effectively for an activation of pathogens, specifically the pathogen called cryptosporidium, which I'll talk about uh, down here. As far as the drinking water supply goes, UV had not been used much in the U.S. before uh, the year 2000 on a municipal scale. However, there's lots of small systems that have used UV for many, many years. In Europe, though, um, UV has been used for quite a bit, as well as ozone for disinfection of drinking water, uh, because in Europe there's kind of a, a different way and a different approach to treating water. In Europe, a lot of the countries there tend to treat water for biological stability and to stabilize the water, and then just use um, a very low dose of, say, ozone or UV light for disinfection. And then sometimes they don't even have a residual chemical to stay with the water as it travels through the pipes to the, um, to the tap because the water is fairly stable and they're not worried about regrowth of microorganisms. They don't have a lot of organic matter in the water left over. So UV has actually been used quite a bit in Europe um, and in many systems um, throughout Europe. In the U.S. and also in other countries, small systems like households and non-community systems like um, trailer parks and schools have used UV quite a bit and quite effectively. But it wasn't until 1998 when it was discovered that UV is very effective against a pathogen called cryptosporidium that UV really became on the scene as far as large municipal systems. And since then, it's really taken off and is recognized as the best available technology. And the reason why the cryptosporidium issue was so important is because in the U.S. we had a huge outbreak of cryptosporidiosis in 1993 in the city of Milwaukee. About 400,000 people got sick. Over 100 people died from that outbreak. This is in a big U.S. city in the 1990s. You know, it's kind of an outrage that something like this large could happen, but it was caused from cryptosporidium. And the main issue with cryptosporidium is that if your filters somehow go bad and they're not taking out the particles, which cryptosporidium is typically removed with, with filters, chlorine as a defense system does not work at all for cryptosporidium. It's a very hardy organism. It's, it exists in a cyst-like form, and chlorine cannot penetrate or inactivate that pathogen. But it turns out UV is very, very effective for cryptosporidium. In fact, it's easier to kill cryptosporidium, which is very tough, with UV light than it is to kill even a bacteria, simple bacteria. So UV was found to be very effective against cryptosporidium and also against Giardia, another pathogen. And UV was then deemed as a, a best available technology for disinfection of water that has the threat of cryptosporidium contamination. So there's a number of drivers that I mentioned for UV and water treatment. Uh, the first one is uh, sensibility. UV makes a lot of sense for wastewater. You know, it's a quick disinfectant. You don't have to add a chemical and then take it out. Um, it's a non-chemical process, so that is attractive to many municipalities and many um, operators say you don't have to deal with a chemical, dump it in, figure out what's going on. There's no byproducts that are formed, unlike chlorine. Um, it's effective against cryptosporidium and giardia, which chlorine is very ineffective against. And it's also thought of as a green technology. I mean, any technology that uses photons is cool. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's neat. It sounds like it's futuristic. So I think that has a little bit of appeal to it. And it's important to have a little sex appeal on your water treatment processes. You, know, you have to get it somewhere. OK, so how does UV actually work? <clears throat> UV light, and when I'm talking about UV light, it's a broad spectrum of light. It's 100 nanometers up to 400 nanometers. And the pic nice colorful picture here shows the electromagnetic spectrum. And these are the nanometers down here, the wavelengths. It's down 100 up to 780. And this range right here is our visible wavelengths. So the, you know from blue up to red. And below 400 is what we call the UV wavelengths, because it's ultraviolet. It's beyond the violet. This is the violet, very extreme violet of the visible range. Beyond the violet is the UV range. And then we have different types of UV, UVA, UVB, UVC, and vacuum UV. So vacuum UV exists below 200 nanometers, and it only exists in a vacuum because oxygen absorbs those wavelengths of light, and they wouldn't get very far unless you had a vacuum situation. So below 200 nanometers, not much use of UV light there. UV A and B are emitted by the sunlight. So sunlight actually emits all these wavelengths, but thankfully we have an ozone layer that protects the Earth from these damaging UV wavelengths below the UVB range. So anything below about 290 nanometers is filtered out by the ozone layer, which is good because those wavelengths tend to be germicidal, tend to be mutagenic, and we want to make sure we don't 
get exposed to those. So thankfully, we have the ozone layer. Uh, so the sunlight emits UVA, UVB, and below UVB is UVC, and that's really the active range that we like to use for UV disinfection because it's very effective. It's very germicidal. What, what it does is it gets absorbed very strongly by an organism's DNA, nucleic acids, and those nucleic acids, which normally look like this, this nice double helix on the left side, after it gets exposed to UV, the energy gets transferred, breaks up those bonds, and creates damage sites on the nucleic acids of an organism. And then it prevents that organism from replicating because its DNA is damaged. It can't replicate its DNA, so it can't replicate itself. And if it can't replicate, it can't cause an infection because infections are based on propagation of the organism. So UV is a very kind of, I think of it as a, a nice, a kind killer. It, it just kind of sterilizes the organism, lives out its life, dies off, happy, just can't reproduce. That's opposed to other disinfectants that you know, go in and tend to be like dynamite. They'll just blow up the organism, blow it apart, and then it's gone. You know, it's done. So UV is much more friendly, if you want to think about it like that. Um, but UV is effective against bacteria, against viruses, against protozoa, you know, all kinds of organisms, because all of them have nucleic acids, and all of them, all their livelihoods are based on their intact nucleic acids. So UV attacks directly those, dis those um, aspects of the organism. And it's very targeted. And you see here, this is the absorbance of DNA, this little hump here. And you see it peaks right in that wavelength around 260 nanometers. And it turns out engineered UV sources emit light right around that same wavelength, that 254 nanometers. So it's very effective for disinfection of, of pathogens because that light is directly absorbed by the DNA, by the nucleic acids. And that nucleic acids then can kind of be destroyed or deformed. And we can effectively achieve disinfection of that microorganism. So what does it take when you have a new technology coming in the 21st century? I mean, it's, we're quite, we have quite a bit of scrutiny in, in things that come along these days. And we want to make sure we, you know, we're doing the right thing and we accept something new into the community of, of water and make sure it's going to be, be um, a good technology to use. So what I think it takes to get a technology accepted is you have to have some what I call the good stuff, which just means you have to have validation procedures to validate those technologies. This is an essential part of any new technology. I mean, you'd be amazed at how many new technologies come along all the time. Someone figures something out in their garage, bring it over to EPA and said, hey, look at this great technology. You should use it. And so we have to validate that, make sure their claims are right. We need to have our safety factors in place. We need to have basic research that proves and shows the fundamentals of those processes. We need to have sensors to monitor things. We need to have certificates of validation. And we ideally, we have also mathematical models to describe the processes. These are what I call the good stuff. The bad stuff, we want to have things that we don't want to see in the technologies. We want to make sure there's no byproducts that are harmful, no harmful side effects. We want to make sure you know, that, that if it fails, it's going to fail safe. Um, there's no toxic materials. It's not dangerous to handle. And there's no residuals. And ideally, we want to require the good stuff and then minimize the bad things. And for UV disinfection, it's had to go through all those types of hurdles. As since it got accepted into the community around the year 2000, EPA said, well, let's use UV. Let's make sure it's, it's a technology we can use in the US and eventually worldwide and make sure we could do it right. Now, keep in mind, Europe had already been using UV for years and years and years in the municipal systems. But hey, you know, it's discovered in America must be new for us. So we have to try it on our own and, and do it ourselves. And of course, other countries will then follow. So the availability of UV disinfection was actually a fundamental premise of recent federal regulations in the U.S. Without UV, the U.S. EPA would not have been able to implement some regulations around cryptosporidium and activation. Because UV is so effective against cryptosporidium, there's no other technology really to use other than you know, membranes, which are kind of high cost. Uh, so U.S. EPA recognized that UV was a new technology in the industry, and we need to develop more information and develop validation procedures to allow it to be used so we can use it confidently. So I was involved in a process in the early 2000s to develop the UV disinfection guidance manual. Uh, the EPA hired a bunch of people, a bunch of uh, consulting companies and academics. And we came up with this manual that has, it's very, very comprehensive. It's you know, hundreds of pages long, uh, lots of appendices, lots of methods and procedures and um, things to do to make sure you can approve UV and make sure it works right. Um, so 2003, we put out a draft. The final one came out in 2006. It includes specifics about methods to use for microbes, validation examples, what happens if, say, the lamps break, all kinds of things are about it. Um, so there's so many components of that validation protocol um, that it became like this, you know, this massive document. And it was distilled down a little bit more. And there's other offshoots of, of it. But you know, all these things had to be considered when you think about a new technology. And UV went through all the hoops. So for validation of UV disinfection, it requires hydraulic validation. Uh, mathematical models, for instance, 
validating the lamps themselves have to get validated before they're used, validating the sensors that are used, knowing how to measure UV transmittance. These are all important features of UV processes. You want to make sure the light's getting into the water and it's causing disinfection. Then you have to test the system out. We do what we call the bioassay test challenge. So we have to uh, spike in a microorganism and make sure it gets killed through the system and make sure it's killed over various um, types of uh, um, water quality parameters and, and, and flow rates. I want to make sure there's an online monitoring protocol so you can measure UV and make sure it's working all the time. And then, of course, evaluate safety factors and bias and all that. So this is a, a massive undertaking to think about validating UV. Um, and a couple of centers were set up around the U.S. Uh, actually as centers for, for validating UV technologies. Now they're actual just technology validation centers. But this one center in New York State was took, took over an abandoned wastewater treatment plant. This is a huge facility. You know, there's... Um, can treat millions and millions of gallons of water per day and test out systems that were very, very large. So this is um, big basins that, that hold water that's treated and that you spike in the microorganisms to and you run through um, UV systems that are housed in these tents here. So this is a huge facility that was built just for the purpose of validating UV systems on the expectation that there'd be a lot of systems that need to get validated so they can go into drinking water plants and, and reuse plants um, and serve the public and protect public health. In addition to the validation centers, a lot of UV disinfection research was, was um, spurred on by the interest in UV at the federal level in the U.S. And we got involved in a lot of this research. A lot of it was looking at fundamentals, like what dose of UV do you need to kill pathogens? Um, how do we think about modeling systems? What kind of new models can we come up with? How do we understand UV systems? Now, UV is really tricky because with chlorine or another chemical, you can actually take the water out of the system, measure the amount of chemical in that water, and then know how much chemical you have so you know what kind of disinfection you're expecting. For UV light, you can't take the water out of the system because the photons are traveling at the speed of light, which is very fast. By the time you take the water out, they're gone, and you can't measure how much UV is in there. So you have to have something internal or some way of assessing the UV system. So we have to have new methods developed pretty much to understand UV and measure it effectively. And we borrowed methods from Europeans who had had validation procedures in place and, and from what was known in the past. But the research really went on. Quite a bit of research went on. It's still going on. We're now understanding you know, new technologies. Um, we're now starting to look at, say, LED lights for UV disinfection. So it's, it's, it keeps on, on changing. Uh, but research is still going on. That research really, was really pushed forward by uh, these federal regulations. Uh, <clears throat> so research went on. And then eventually, UV has been accepted um, all over the world now for, for disinfection and for applications in drinking water. Um, UV is used all over the United States. Um, one of the main areas it's used in is, is in unfiltered drinking water supplies. Now, you may be feel like it's kind of strange to have a drinking water supply that doesn't have a filter on it. But a lot of drinking water supplies have such great catchment and such great protected areas that you can actually avoid filtration because the water coming out of that, that area is so clean, you probably don't even need disinfection in many cases. Um, but that's true for the cities of New York. The whole city of New York has a catchment that doesn't filter their water at all because it's kind of a protected area. And I grew up in New York City, so I'm proud of our drinking water. It tastes really good. Um, and it turns out they barely did any treatment. All they did is add a little chlorine to the water and distribute it. But because of the concern of cryptosporidium, which is only removed by filtration, EPA says, well, if you're unfiltered and you have a certain level of water quality, you have to put in something else to protect against cryptosporidium. We don't want another Milwaukee outbreak. So that something else is now UV light. And UV light's fast-acting disinfectant, very effective against cryptosporidium. It's used in New York City. And New York treats about 2 billion gallons of water per day. It's about 8 billion liters of water per day. That's a lot of water. And they have UV for all that water. I'll show you at the end a picture of the, the UV disinfection system they have in that. They have basically 55 UV systems that treat each about 60 million gallons per day. So it's a huge system. City of Boston, the same thing. Seattle, Vancouver, um, many, many areas have catchments that are well protected. And Melbourne has an amazing catchment. It's a beautifully protected area, great water quality. Doesn't really need water filtration either. Although, at some points, if there's fires and other things in the catchment, that can uh, impact the water quality. So there's some needs there for, for uh, things to be put in place. But in general, all these areas have really good water quality. <clears throat> UV is used in filtered water as well in Colorado, all over the US. It's applied as a multi-barrier approach. And multi-barrier means, like, let's have a lot of things in place to make sure we can protect against pathogens. And UV is one of those tools that should be in, in the toolbox. And it's now validated also to meet the groundwater rule to, to, for virus inactivation uh, and for small systems. So there's a lot of activity for UV. It's been accepted by the community, and it's went through this rigorous process. And that's what it takes to get something accepted here in the 21st century.
Let's take a step back and look at chlorine. <clears throat> if you think about adding chlorine to a system in the 21st century, let's see what we'd look at and think about how we'd approach um, chlorine. <clears throat> so the first thing we'd look at is how effective is it against pathogens? You know, for chlorine, we can use chlorine in the form of free chlorine, which is kind of like bleach that you use in your, in your household. <clears throat> or you can use combined chlorine, which is a chloramine product, which is combining chlorine with ammonia. It makes a little bit more stable chlorine product that doesn't degrade as fast when you have it in your pipe network. You want to look at ease of use of handling the chlorine. One of the things that's really of concern these days is, is the use of chlorine gas. Um, it's not because it's necessarily we don't know how to handle it, but chlorine gas is a very, very toxic product, obviously. It's a, you know, it's, it's a toxic gas. It's a it's green gas that's really heavy, and it doesn't disperse quickly. And it's not so, so much a problem using chlorine gas, but the problem is transporting the chlorine gas tankers through communities that used to be far away from our water treatment plants and our wastewater plants, but now they're actually encroaching and coming closer and closer. So it's almost an insurance issue and a safety issue now. And there have been instances of tanker trucks you know, crashing, falling over, breaking apart, uh, rail lines also, and that's a big concern. So people are moving more toward hypochlorous acid, which is like bleach, liquid chlorine, as a more safer alternative. Um, the other thing about chlorine that you need to think about is byproducts. What are the unknowns? What do we know about chlorine as far as its reactions in water? And what don't we know? And it's amazing how much we actually don't know right now. But it's, we've made amazing inroads in terms of what we do know. Let's first look at disinfection. So first for chlorine, uh, free chlorine disinfection. This is chlorine on its own, <clears throat> not, a, not a combined chlorine. Chlorine is known to be very, very effective and excellent against viruses. And you can imagine viruses are very small. They're a chemical. They can attack a small virus. Uh, the, uh, chlorine can attack a small virus um, very easily by dis disrupting its coat and destroying the organism. It's also very effective against bacteria. But as I mentioned before, it's not effective against things that look like this, cryptosporidium and giardia. You see this giardia cyst, this really tough outer layer around the giardia. It's hard to penetrate that with chemicals. Photons, on the other hand, go right through it and attack the DNA and, and destroy the organism. And these are very, very... Um, robust organisms that last a long time in the environment. So chlorine um, is very ineffective against cryptosporidium. Sunlight's ineffective against cryptosporidium, even though it has a little bit of UV. It's not the right kind of UV. Um, temperature is ineffective. So it's, these cysts kind of last in the environment for a long, long time. And they're, they're of concern for drinking water. <clears throat> chloramines, I mentioned chloramines are com combinations of chlorine plus ammonia in the right ratios. They can form chloramines and for a while in the United States, um, free chlorine was used, but then there was concern about free chlorine because it was very reactive with the water. So people started moving toward chloramines, which is less reactive, but they're also less effective against, for disinfection. And there's some other unintended consequences of chlor chlorination that were of concern I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but chlorine's not very, chloramines are not very effective against uh, viruses at all. It doesn't have the right kind of oxidation power. They are somewhat effective against bacteria to keeping bacterial growth down, but they're not really great as a primary disinfectant. It takes really, really long contact times of, of potentially hours to affect disinfection with chloramines. So we have free chlorine and chloramines as the two forms of chlorine that are used in drinking water. <clears throat> the next thing is the disinfection byproducts. So this is a graph that I took from a friend of mine, David Reckow. He's a professor at the University of Massachusetts. And he calls the chlorinated DBP an iceberg. Chlorinated DBP is an iceberg. And that's because we only know a little bit about what's above ground, above, above the water level. And there's actually a lot down there that we might not know. <clears throat> and Dave's what I call a DBP hunter, a disinfection byproduct hunter. There's other ones out there, Stuart Krasner and other folks. But they look for DBPs. They look for disinfection byproducts. That's where they spend their, their lives. They're really excellent chemists. And they're trying to understand when you put chlorine in water, what actually happens, what forms. So we know there's some compounds that we can monitor for. These are the information collection rule in the US. We can monitor for these. We're looking for those. Um, folks like uh, Stuart Krasner come in and try to look at these byproducts. He's identified a number of them. I uh, mentioned Dave Reckow coming in, looking at other ones. So we have to dig deep and understand Thank you. Um, the possibilities for um, the number of compounds that might actually form. Because there's a lot of compounds in there that these DBP hunters don't actually haven't found yet. And we need to know what they are. And some of them are um, under the iceberg. Some of them are, are these halogenated compounds. And halogenated just means that they have a halogen group on them, such as uh, chlorine or bromine, that are, that are attached to the, to the compound. And they get, when they get chlorinated, if there's bromide in the water, that bromine can also get incorporated. These are chlorinated compounds. And non-halogenated compounds are ones that don't have the chlorine associated with them. <clears throat> so an overall view of the, of the 
total organic compounds that have chlorine associated with them are called TOX or total organic halides. And these are kind of a breakdown of the known ones and the unknown ones. So as far as the known ones, the ones that are regulated are mainly called trihalomethanes, these THMs, and haloacetic acids, they're called HAAs. And these are the ones that are regulated in most uh, industrialized societies. So when we put them in, we know these are forming, and we regulate them because they're actually carcinogenic compounds. Many of them are carcinogenic compounds. Um, some of them we don't know their activity, but we know we can measure these and want to make sure we minimize them in our drinking water supply. Other compounds we don't really know about, there's a whole slew of compounds, you know, over 60% of the compounds we actually don't even know what they are. No one's identified them. Now, we know that there's some toxicity in there. We don't know where it's coming from. We know it might be toxic to a certain, you know, certain types of toxicity assays. Its impact on human health, we actually don't know yet. And it may not be an impact, or it may be an impact, but these are things that we just don't know at this point. So as far as chlorine goes and chlorina chlorination goes, we know some of these. Some of them are regulated. Some of them we know, but they're not yet regulated, like haloacetonitriles and bromochloroacetic acid. They're not yet regulated, but we know that they're of concern, and we know they're forming, and people can measure those. So looking at chlorine, free chlorine versus chloramines, um, chloramines actually minimized the byproduct formation, uh, which is why they started to be used a little bit more. Um, chlor chloramines don't form as many of these halogenated organics. Um, forms a little bit more of the nitrogenated disinfection byproducts, as noted down here, which are of concern. Um, and other concerns with chloramines is that when you have ammonia in the water, potentially you can grow ammonia oxidizing bacteria in your distribution system, in your pipe system. And the other concern is that it might reduce lead in the pipes, if there's uh, pipe issues with lead. And then when people, when, they switched over, when we switched over to chloramines in the drinking water system, um, there was a warning out that said, if you have a fish tank, make sure you dechlorinate the water because you'll harm your fish because there's some ammonia in that water too. Um, so that was a concern in the public that, well, what's in this water that my fish are going to die if I give it to them? So that's a concern too. Looking at chlorine, there's many ways that we get exposed to chlorinated compounds. And you think first about drinking them, but in reality, what we found out is the drinking water ingestion is not actually a big concern as far as human health. The bigger concerns are inhalation concerns and dermal concerns, because that's a big exposure. These compounds are called volatile organic compounds, so they actually volatilize, and especially in hot water. Um, so when you're showering, you might actually get more exposure to some of these compounds than you do when you're drinking the water. And I don't want to get you scared about it, because it's been in our water. It's been amazing for public health. Chlorine's protected us from a lot of sicknesses. But we do need to just be aware of these issues when we think about a technology that we're using now. And if we can minimize them, we have to make sure we try to do that. So here's our activity, such as drinking. We have ingestion, showering and washing. We have dermal and inhalation exposures, preparing beverages or food, washing your clothes, and then dishwashing. These all are routes of human exposure that we need to assess and make sure we understand them so we can make a good um, understanding of the risks associated with uh, different levels of chlorine and then set our regulations so that we're protecting the public health and giving them clean drinking water that's not going to be of concern whether they're breathing the, the vapors in or ingesting the water. Another thing with chlorine that I find a little bit puzzling is that we still, after all these years, don't have a good handle on the chlorine dose that we're actually <coughs> adding to the water and how to measure that dose. And people talk about chlorine doses very differently. So on the top graph here, when you add chlorine to the water, you might want to have in mind that at the end of 60 minutes of contact time, I want to make sure I have, say, one milligram per liter of chlorine left so that, you know, that goes into my distribution system. It protects the water from any regrowth of microbes. So you add a certain amount of chlorine. Say you add about four milligrams per liter of chlorine. That's right up here. And as you add the chlorine in and the, it reacts with the water, the chlorine actually degrades. So it goes down in, in concentration until it reaches a steady level. This is kind of the chlorine history, chlorine concentration history throughout the water. Now, when people measure chlorine doses, they use a concept called CT. It's a concentration of chlorine times the time of exposure, C times T. And what they do typically, and, and some people do different things, sometimes they say, well, I put in four milligrams per liter, and I had it for over 90 minutes, so it's four times 90, 360, um, 360 milligram per liter times minutes is my dose. So that's this concept here. So some people might say that my dose of chlorine is 360. Some people say, well, at the end of 90 minutes, I know I had a, about, you know, uh, what is it, about a few, half a, half a milligram per liter left over. So I multiply by 90 minutes, and then I say, okay, I have a 36, in this case, uh, 36 milligrams per liter per minute. 
And that's another way to exp express the same amount of chlorine that we put in here expressed two different ways. And there's no real agreement or standard in the industry of how we do this. And what you should really do is take the integration of this curve under the curve here, and that total amount is actually your chlorine exposure, your chlorine dose. And that's 196 milligrams per liter a minute. But there's no really rigorous standard way of, of reporting this, and this has always bugged me because people talk about it differently, and people kind of just talk off the cuff about how much their chlorine dose is. So I think you know, chlorine hasn't really had this serious scrutiny about how we're reporting it, how we're monitoring it, and certainly hydraulics we don't know much about. We just say, well, it went through this basin, and it went around here, and we think that everything got exposed to the same amount of chlorine, when in reality, there's probably a lot of different concentrations of chlorine in, in different parts of the basin, and we don't really know what the chlorine dose was. So that's the kind of beef I have with chlorine as well, um, that we need to be more rigorous. And we put UV through this rigorous process. Let's rethink how we're doing other things in, in our drinking water as well. Let's look back at an ideal water treatment process. Again, what I said earlier, my ideal water treatment process has no synthetic harmful chemicals. It's free of unwanted byproducts. It's free of un unwanted residuals. There's no unintended consequences. It uses sustainable materials, no energy or low energy, fast acting, and it's easy to operate. So uh, this is ideal. <clears throat> so when we look at all the different possible disinfectants, <clears throat> they all have different benefits and different, different problems. Uh, this table here shows the disinfectants up here, like chlorine, chloramines, UV light, and I threw in ozone just as a comparison. And then, say, bacteria, virus, and protozoa, how they are against those, and then other things like byproducts, storage, and things. <clears throat> we look at chlorine itself. It's excellent against bacteria and viruses, but it's very poor against protozoa. You know, so you want to say, for protozoa, I want to make sure, well, chlorine's not going to work, chlorine's not going to work. UV would work good. Ozone could work pretty good. Viruses, chlorine would work great. You know, chloramine's not good. UV light's good, but not great, and ozone's excellent. So you can think about a matrix here of maybe can we put these different technologies together in a series or in a sequence and really make sure we minimize the bad stuff and optimize the objectives of treatment. So I thought a lot about disinfectants and, and water treatment. And looking at experiences in Europe and other parts of the world, um, you know, I've come to some ideas and I've, I've always wondered why we're doing what we're doing. And in 2007, I wrote a, an op-ed piece that got cited once or twice, I think, not too many times. Um, but I call it a water treatment revolution. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm an associate editor for the um, Journal of Environmental Engineering, and we get to write every year or two a, a, an op-ed piece or kind of a, our own editorial. So I wrote one on water treatment. What I, what I argued in there <clears throat> is that we need to be more global on how we look at water. We're, we're very, very kind of parochial and, and regional in terms of what we think about when we think about water, at least in the US we are. I think my experiences here in Australia are, you know, Looking at some of the guidelines, you have examples from South Africa, from Europe, from America. You know, you're taking WHO standards. In the U.S., we tend to think more, you know, this is U the U.S., we have to do it the U.S. way. Um, we need to be more global. That was my first argument. We need to take holistic approaches. We need to have multiple barriers, and we need to work, move away from this patchwork processes of processes where we have a problem, let's throw a fix on it, not think about the holistic system. Um, so I argued for this. And one of the things I really like about other places and how they treat their water is that they use more an approach of stabilizing the water from a biological standpoint. In terms of let's get rid of all the food, all the nutrients, all the carbon sources that bacteria are going to grow on after we let it leave the water treatment process. You know, why do we leave stuff in the water that's going to cause a problem downstream and then add chlorine as a hammer kind of to help it doesn't grow once you send it down the pipes? We need to stabilize our water up front and then we could minimize those, those patchworks that we put on afterwards. And the other question was, you know, why do we spend so much energy and money accommodating chlorine and accommodating the, the negatives of chlorine and trying to fix those versus just totally rethinking its use. And so I came up with a number of possibilities of sequences for disinfectants that can be used that would give a holistic approach to treatment and thinking about using chlorine in some of them and maybe not using chlorine in others. The first group I call the chlorine crutch in terms of we're still going to use chlorine, but we're going to make sure we kind of minimize its bad parts. Um, one of those could be saying using ozone for oxidation, using UV for bacteria, viruses, and protozoa, and then using chloramines in the distribution system, the DS, for stabilizing our water, make sure we don't have any regrowth. That's one, one way. Another way is using uh, ozone at a higher dose for different approaches, using UV at a lower dose just for the protozoa and bacteria. Uh, you can think about using just UV and chlorine as a holistic approach. You need to think about using UV plus chlorine, free chlorine, and then chloramines. So a lot of different ways to do that. And then another way to look at it, things is to go for the biostability, going for let's stabilize the water and minimize um, the use of oxidants. So in this case, we use ozone up front, 
you can use what's called uh, biological granular activated carbon. It's GAC. It's a carbon source. It's like a water, little water filter that takes out some things from the water, but it has biological growth on it. And that biology actually consumes some of the organic matter in the water and stabilizes it so we don't have regrowth later on. Then you use UV, and you don't need any distribution system uh, chemicals. A lot of places in, in Europe use a little bit of chlorine dioxide. It's a much more stable form of chlorine. It doesn't have the byproducts that free chlorine does. It has some other challenges, but this is used very, very low levels, like 0.1 or 0.2 milligrams per liter of chlorine dioxide after treating the water biologically, stabilizing the water, using UV, for instance, or ozone, and then having a minimal amount of chlorine in the distribution system. And this is, for instance, like in, in the Netherlands or Germany or Austria, this might be the approach they take there, or not even using any disinfectant, not even using any chlorine for the pipes, because the water is so stable, they don't need to worry about regrowth and, and bacteria coming up again. And then for a groundwater source, it starts a little bit cleaner, so you can actually just use UV directly, and it's fairly stable already coming from most groundwater sources. So those are some possibilities thinking about how water treatment maybe could be redesigned to think about using chlorine a little bit more smartly, or maybe not using chlorine and having a different approach to how we treat water. So putting all these thoughts together, um, overall, uh, these are the kind of take-home messages I'm hoping that you're getting from what I'm talking to you about today. The first one is that chlorine disinfection has had amazing impacts on human health and public health protection. And, and I don't want to knock chlorine because it's done incredible things. And in fact, it's probably the number one cause of, of disease reduction in developing countries today. Um, it has a really huge place in our drinking water portfolio, and it's done great things for public health, as you see from the work that's been done back from the early 1900s and up through today. But however, our modern day knowledge really begs us to look at it a little bit differently. Um, it's unlikely, I think, if regulators today came across this toxic green chlorine gas and said, yeah, let's put it under water. It's a great idea. I can't imagine that would be used right away as a first, as a first resort. But chlorine in itself, it can be less harmful if we have pretreatment measures in place and we use it smartly. So we have to think about how we're using chlorine and make sure we're not just using it kind of haphazardly and just trying to fix it um, as a second thought. I really want you to think also about alternatives such as UV. I didn't talk about ozone, but ozone's another technology that can be used because uh, it can mitigate many of the concerns with chlorine. UV is a technology uh, has gone through probably the most scrutiny I've ever seen for a technology. Um, and it's really been evaluated very robust, robustly. And that's a good thing for UV, and I think it should be done that way. Um, and now we have a good feel for how it works, and we know what, what its limitations are and where it can be applied. And finally, I, I really think we need to look beyond our traditions of using chlorine and the way we think about water treatment and have some more innovations in water treatment and indeed have a revolution in how we think about water treatment because I think a revolution's in order given we know what we know and we know what we wish we knew back in the 1900s, perhaps. So with that, I'd like to, um, to close my talk. Uh, this is a picture of me at the UV disinfection facility in New York. This is one of the four areas of UV disinfection uh, reactors. These are uh, systems here. Each, each is one system that treats about 60 million gallons per day. So there's four of these galleyways going in different directions. It's a pretty huge system, but it's uh, pretty amazing if you get a chance to visit. So thanks a lot for your attention.